Well, please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. And we are continuing our walk through uh, 1 Timothy. And we are continuing today, and, and Lord willing, finalizing our uh, three week discussion of, of pastors, elders in the church. Really, I think as we look at these, these epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, uh, and, I've, and, I, and I've said this, I'm sure, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, they're often called the pastoral epistles. Um, but one brother said that they may be better called the ecclesial epistles. That is, uh, epistles about the church. Not just pastors, but, but how the church is to be ordered and structured and what a healthy church looks like. And so we have really in these, in these scriptures a, a, a vision, God's vision of a biblical church. And so we're trying to learn that and to discern the mind of Christ. And so I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to start with verse 1 today. Excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 1. And this is God's word. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. May God bless the reading of his word today. Father, we thank you for the riches that are ours in Christ. Um, Lord, we thank you that you've given your church faithful instruction on how we can respond in faithfulness to you. And so, God, I pray that these discussions um, would not just be sort of textbook explanations of ordering a church, but that, that we would be encouraged to respond in faith, um, to see this church grow. We always want to grow in, in, in healthiness and, um, in, in, in to be more biblical. Lord, till glory, that's going to be our job. And so would you use this time for the edification of this body? Mature us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it had to be about 1991. And so my math is not all that great, but that puts us about 30 years ago, I think, or so, right? Um, and it was the time uh, when AYSO soccer was gearing up. And maybe some of you that are parents were soccer junkies and spent your Saturdays at the field uh, at all of the games. Um, but it was time to sign up, and at this time I was, I was living with my aunt Heidi and my cousin Sean, love you guys, and, uh, and we were brought to the sign-up to go sign up for soccer. And, and Heidi, my aunt, was very excited that it was time for soccer and we were going to play soccer and we were a year apart, so she had finagled and got us on the same team, which wasn't really supposed to happen, but uh, made that happen just for convenience sake. And so we were signed up for soccer. The only thing missing was I had no desire whatsoever to play soccer. <laughs> um, wasn't really into sports. was more into skateboarding and those sort of things. And so I didn't really want to play soccer. She was excited for me and for us, and so we played soccer, and I was the kid that was out in the field playing fullback, shooting lasers out of my fingers, and sort of in my own little world, and oh, hey, we're, we're in the middle of a game. Um, and so as we, as we look at this text today, Paul begins, he opens up the section on elders with the needed uh, a peace element here that a man must desire for the office of elder. That the aspiration is a needed key in this combination of a man being called into office. We don't want to drag him kicking and screaming, right, to practice or to, to preaching. And so we see, as we, as we consider here, I just read that opening text. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Um, we commonly call this desire, this God-given desire, the internal call. The internal call to the ministry. And that is a, a subjective sort of stirring of the heart in a man to serve Christ in the local church. It deals with the reality.
of him a sinner standing before the people of God with an open Bible and having something helpful to say to God's people and not be struck down in the midst of it by the Lord. Um, But I believe if God is really calling a man that this will be an unshakable burden that he will have in his inside of him. Um, Jeremiah speaks of this in Jeremiah 20 and 9. He says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. I cannot. He says, if I try to stop speaking in the name of this God, something wells up in me, and I cannot contain it. The apostles, when they were arrested and brought before the civil authorities and threatened, here's what they say in Acts 4.19, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. They had beheld the glories of Christ, and they had to. They had a burden to declare and to proclaim that. And Paul, writing to the Corinthian church in his first letter in chapter 9, he says this, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And so there must be this internal aspiration of a man to the ministry. He has to have some desire, a growing budding desire that he cannot seem to shake. Many men, uh, myself included, will run from this call for a time, this burden, um, but God gets his way in the end. (laughs) But it's not just the internal call, right? It's not just a desire from someone, but there's also what we call the external call. And the external call is the affirmation of the church, that a man is gifted, that a man is being used of God, that he's helpful, that he is an able shepherd. He will not be polished and, 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 and arrived or what have you in the early stages. Um, but when you sit under his ministry, you will be helped by him. You will learn from him. You will grow as he preaches, prays, leads in song, uh, exhorts you from the word, whatever it may be. And so as the church makes that call or affirms that call, as the church, the church observes and tests a man, uh, we come to the question again of what should we be looking for in an elder? How, how do we discern a man that ought to be called and, and a man that not ought to be called? How do we be sure to, to raise up the right person and not the wrong person as best as we can? Well, two weeks back, Paul preached, and he opened this section looking at seven qualifiers for an elder in the church. That that was seven things that he must be if he's going to be qualified for this office of elder in the church of Jesus Christ. Six of those seven qualifiers were related to his character, him personally as a man. The, the, I think, umbrella uh, characteristic there is that he's above reproach. Right, as our brother said, there's not, some, there's not things on him that you can grasp, that you can uh, accuse him of. There's not glaring holes in his life, in his family, that you can say, what about this and, and what about that? So he's above reproach. He's a husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. And then there's one thing that speaks to his ability, one gifting, one, one skill, if you will, And that is that he must be able to teach the word. He has to be apt to teach. He will not be there. He will not be polished. He will not know all of the intricacies. But he has to have a God-given ability to open up the Bible before people and help them. This one skill, this one gifting, is what distinguishes the elder from all other Christians. As we'll begin to see next week deacons share almost all of the same character requirements as an elder. The only difference is that the elder must be able to teach. I think as we look at these qualifications, we understand that every Christian really is to live up to this standard, right? All Christians should be above reproach, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not a drunkard, not violent, right? Those are not exclusive to elders. Elders should model and exemplify these characteristics. 
And many Christians will be able to teach. They'll have a gift of teaching. But if a man is to hold the office of elder in a church, he must have an ability, a growing ability to teach the word. And so today we're going to see four disqualifiers. Last time it was seven things he must be. Today we'll see four things that he must not be, that we do not want to see as we're looking at men to train them and raise them up in the body of Christ or in the church of Jesus Christ. So four disqualifiers and then three final requirements. And the three final requirements seem important because the previous 11, Paul just rattled off in a list, but the final three, he explains each one of them. He gives his reasoning. So they seem to have some importance. And so 1 Timothy verse uh, 3, let me start in verse 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And then here's our verse for, for, for today. Not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. So he is to be not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. I've, I've tried to think through these four disqualifications. And, and if I could sum them up, I would say that an elder must have his passions restrained. He must have his passions restrained. Or to say it like this, an elder must keep a disciplined watch over his lusts, over his appetites, and over his passions. And so the first thing that we see here is that his desire to escape through drink must be restrained. And I'm going to add drug there, drink and drug, in our intoxicated day, whether that be prescription pills or the pot shop or alcohol or whatever else it may be. His desire to escape through intoxication must be restrained. Let me read to you what some of the old men like Matthew Poole and Matthew Henry would say. They say he cannot be an ale, steak, a tavern, haunter, a common tippler, a wine bibber, or one that makes bibbing at a tavern his trade, nor a sitter at wine. <laughs> he can't be a drunkard. Right? He's not to be a man that indulges himself in drink. He's not to be a man that is given over to the intoxication of alcohol or of other substances. I think we all understand that, that pretty much always substance abuse is a symptom of a deeper problem. Right? There's more going on. If the guy comes home and every day he has to line up shots after work or is three or six or nine beers every night, there's more going on. At the very least, he's drowning out his burdens and troubles and isn't able to deal with them in a disciplined, mature manner. And if a man lacks self-control in that way in his own life, how is he going to be a faithful spiritual guide as he seeks to help others discipline themselves in godliness. We don't have to look far in our families, in our lives, in the mirror to see the devastation that abuse to substances brings. I'm sure everyone in this room has been touched by it in various ways. And so we know that um, it, is, it, it brings many men to ruin, right? Alcohol and, and drugs, the abuse of these things has brought many, many men and families into ruin. Calvin says that to drink wine excessively is not only unbecoming in a pastor, but it commonly draws along with it many things still worse, such as quarrels, foolish attitudes, unchaste conduct, and on and on we could go down that list. And so the elder in the church, an elder, is to be a man that deals with his issues, not with drink and drug, but with the word and prayer. And so his passions in this regard, his desire to escape through intoxication is restrained. Secondly, we see that his temper is to be restrained. His temper is to be restrained. Paul said he is not violent, but gentle. Not violent, but gentle. Others said, that, uh, translated, he's not a bully or he's not a striker. 
he's not a striker. So he's not a man given to violence and anger. He doesn't wield his authority like a club and use intimidation tactics to sort of get what he wants in the church. He's not to be violent, but he is to be gentle. Now, what, is, what, is, what does that word gentle actually mean? You know, is he supposed to be like a lap dog? You know, just a soft sort of um, uh, a guy that gets walked on that never, never says hard things, never confronts anyone. We need, to, we need to understand that we're gentle in light of the rest of the instructions given to elders. Uh, we, we read in 2 Timothy 2.25 that he is to correct his opponents with gentleness. So he is to correct those that contradict. He is to correct those that are unsound, but to do so with a gentle, gracious demeanor. We read that he is to, uh, when there are those that persist in sin, he is to rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. And so an elder can do that by the grace of God gently. Right? We, might, we might not see that as a gentle action, but, but, but Paul says you can. He is to give instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. And he is to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Titus 2.15, he is to declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And so the elder must be able to do these sort of things, but to do them in a gentle manner. Not a violent, he's not a bully that just says, shut up, I'm the pastor, I know what I'm talking about, right? Just sort of dismisses people when they have a concern or an issue. Other ways that word is translated, gentle, is graciousness, courtesy, and tolerance. Matthew Henry says that he ought to deal with the flock with mildness, love, and gentleness. John Gill, the 18th, 19th century Baptist pastor, theologian, um, said, He is not one that wounds with his tongue, being too sharp and severe, as he admonishes weaker Brethren, I think the words of Paul here are fitting in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He says, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Be patient with them all. And so his temper is to be restrained and disciplined. He is to bear with the challenges and the weaknesses of the people of God. Thirdly, his mouth is restrained. His mouth is restrained. Paul says he is not quarrelsome. He is not quarrelsome. Uh, Titus, the letter to Titus, says this in the positive, that he is peaceable. He is peaceable. Again, 2 Timothy 2.24, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And now notice what Paul did there in verse 24. He contrasted being quarrelsome with being kind. He put these things at odds with one another. And that the man that is quarrelsome is not a man that is kind. And so quarrelsome is contentiousness. In the Bible... It has a lot to say about quarreling. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about quarreling. Listen to Titus chapter 3. Speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show perfect courtesy toward all people. That was Titus 3, 2. How about Proverbs 20 and verse 3? It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. You know, I think in our digital day, you know, sometimes when you log into a website, you have a captcha thing with the little squares. This should be there every time. You have to read this verse. It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Because when you go on the book of faces or the bluebird, fools be quarreling, right? That's, that's, what, that's what happens. And we don't want to be fools, Right? And, and so in our day, this carries over to a man how he carries himself online, right? Does he have to quarrel with, does he have to debate and constantly 
demean and talk down and be right over and over. And he's constantly, every post, he has to be the guy that comes in and be, brings the correction because he's the word of truth. Now, you can do that with grace. But every fool, it says, will be quarreling. In Proverbs 18, 6, a fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. His mouth invites a beating. And, and the Proverbs has much to say about us being bogged down in petty controversy, of getting caught up in every little debate and having to go back and forth and be contentious about every single issue that arises. Again, I think Paul's words are helpful. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. And he says all. And that's a challenge because some sheep are challenging, right? Some of us, myself included, can be challenging. We can be hard-headed. We can be stubborn. And God wants us to be patient with every last one of our brothers and sisters. And so he is not to be quarrelsome. He's to be a man that is peaceable with the flock. And fourthly, his desire for personal gain is restrained. His desire for personal gain is restrained. As Paul put it, he is not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. Elsewhere it says he's not covetous or he's not greedy. He's not covetous or he's not greedy. Titus chapter 1 verse 7 says it like this, that he shouldn't be pursuing dishonest gain. And so let's, let's, let's be clear, it's not a sin to have money. Uh, many pastors are bivocational, and if a guy has a business that does well, that's nothing wrong with that. Praise God, if God blesses in that regard. But the love of money, the love of gain, is a powerful drug that clouds the judgments of many men. As the Word says, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not the having of money, but the love of money. But Jesus also said that it's easier uh, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich man to get into heaven because money clouds our, our minds and our thoughts. Jesus, Jesus. And I think, as, 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 as these lists often are, right, we don't look at these lists and say, hey, my glaring sin's not on that list, so I'm okay, right? That's not the point. <laughs> but Paul's painting a picture of, of weaknesses that a man might have. And here, again, I see uh, uh, that he needs to be self-controlled, right? That he needs to have himself restrained. He's not given over to the love of money. He doesn't spout off his mouth every time someone says something. He's not violent and quick-tempered. He's not, he's not uh, abusing alcohol and unwill, unable to, to restrain himself and control himself there. And so he's a man of self-control. He's a man that is disciplined or growing in that regard. As Paul would write Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22, he says, Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And so the godly Christian, exemplified by elders and pastors, is to have his passions, appetites, and lusts restrained, in check. He shouldn't be a man given over to the indulgence of the flesh. And so let me just say one thing here. Um, certainly, every man is going to, to be an imperfect example of these things, right? Only the God-man, Jesus Christ, can live up to these requirements with perfection. But that doesn't get us off the hook. We don't just say, we're all sinners, and so it is what it is. Um, but I believe what Paul is driving at is not that the man is perfect in all these categories, 
but he is an example in these regards. You would look to him and say, I'll, I'll follow him. I, I think he's, he's modeling this well. And he's growing and wants to grow and continue to grow in this regard. So these should be seen in his life. They should be evident. They won't be perfect. We, we can't have an unrealistic ex- standard for anyone. Um, but he needs to be a model of these things. And so how do we discern? As we're talking about raising up elders, as we're talking about observing people and and, and as the church is the one that recognizes and then affirms and appoints a person to office, how do we know if a man is qualified in these areas? How do, how do we discern? Well, I think simply um, we need to get to know them. We need to get to know them. We have the benefit of a church this size that you can know everyone if you, if you want to. You know, many churches that are, that are large churches, there's sort of a green room off behind the, the front, and uh, the, the people that are on stage, the pastors, the elders, what have you, they meet there, and, and that's fine. They pray, at whatever, before the service. But they come out, and the guy preaches, and then he's sort of tucked off back in the green room, and you don't really have access, so you don't really know them often. Or you have to really be on the inner circle to get to know the elders and the, and the pastor. But that's not the case here. And so we have the opportunity to befriend those in our midst. And I encourage you, as men are being used in this church, to observe them. Now, don't be weird. <laughs> you know, don't be, don't be asking them prying questions that are inappropriate. Um, don't be peering around the corner and see, how's he talking to his wife? Um, but we ought to observe, right? Our lives are on display before one another. So what does their character look like? How do they handle their wives? Uh, how do they treat their children? When they're put on the spot with a tough question or painted in the corner, do they you know, what happens? Is there, is there veins bursting out? Well, hey, if he's not yelling, maybe he's restraining his, his passions. <laughs> and so we want to observe, right? We want to get to know people. We want to, to walk along them. They're part of the body just like we all are. Um, and they also need to be tested. They need to be tested. As we see, um, Paul mentions this with the deacons. He says, that, let them also be tested first. Also like, I believe, the elders and so this happens primarily in a church as men are given opportunities to, to function in a ministerial role, right? Whether it's to preach a sermon, to teach a Bible study, to lead in prayer, to lead the service, to lead in song, to lead at the Lord's table, to lead a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, what have you, teaching, to come along on a pastoral issue, to, to join in pastoral visits, all of these various things that a shepherd does, we have opportunities to give men chances to be tested, to be seen. How are they, how are they functioning in these roles, and how are they growing in these roles? And is God, is God using them? Let me give one warning before I move on. Um, as we're observing gifting and calling, uh, we don't want to ask questions like, do I like his style? Or... or or, you know, I just don't like how that guy talks or how he looks or, or, or whatever it may be. Now, sometimes I get it. If a person is, is unable to articulate themselves, if they're scattered in their preaching or they mumble a lot or something, those are areas that can be hard to follow, hard to learn from. Um, but we don't want to have, uh, it's not about personal preference, right? We want to ask questions like, am I learning from his preaching and teaching? Am I being helped when he opens up the Bible? Am I discerning him to be a godly man? Does he seem to have godly character? And does he, does he, is he willing to serve the church and not get any recognition for it? Those are the sort of questions that we want to be thinking about in our minds. And so those were four disqualifiers. And now he gives three final requirements for an elder. Three final requirements. And we find this in verse beginning in verse 4. And we see three things. How does he manage his home? Is he a seasoned Christian? And how is he thought of by outsiders? How is he thought of by outsiders? Don't look at our Facebook reviews if you want to see how <laughs> we're thought of by outsiders. <laughs> we'll get to that. So how does he manage his household? How does he manage his household? This is what Paul says. He says he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Now, I want to read to you as well, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 6, because it's relevant here. 
If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And so Paul sees the Christian household as a proving ground for the Christian ministry. This is the clearest way that we can see how a man is able to shepherd, how he's able to pastor, how he's able to minister, how he's able to lead, how he's able to rule and govern. All of these things are seen in his family. Now, i got to say that I've been wrestling with this word believer in Titus chapter 1. Now, the ESV has faithful in a footnote there, and so that means they, it could be either one. I believe the KJV translated, translates it faithful and not believer. Um, does a man, do his children have to be believers? Is that what Paul is, is driving at? A couple thoughts on that. Firstly, how does that square with the doctrine of election? As the Bible says, salvation is of the Lord. It is ultimately a work that God does. And we might ask the question, well, then at what point of their life must they be a believer? If they're two, if they're four, if they're six, if they're eight, is it just that they don't deny the faith? What if he has four, six, eight, ten kids? Does does every single one have to profess faith in Christ? And if that's the case, if he means believers, then there seems to be an implication that through proper parenting, we can assure the eternal salvation of our kids. And I don't think the Bible communicates those things. I I think the word faithful is better here, and I'm not just saying this to get my own self off the hook with adult children that are right now not walking with the Lord. Um, But this was a real issue for me this week, wrestling through this. Um, The way I see this, and I've read broadly is that, again, as Paul says, he must manage his household well with dignity, keeping his children in uh, a submissive. And so the idea is that he's a respectable father. He's not a domineering tyrant. He's not a cruel disciplinarian that gets his way with an iron fist, but he manages his family in a respectable way, in a dignified way. And his children, then, there's a measure of respect that they have for him, for their father. They, they listen to him. He's managed his household in a, in a way that is proper. And, and as Titus said, they're not uh, open to a charge of debauchery and insubordination. That is, they're not completely wild and out of control. Another question that we have to wrestle with here is, is, is it all children of all ages, adult children, and, and, and the Bible presents this idea that when a, when, a, when, a, when a husband, a man, leaves his family, you know, he cleaves to his wife and he comes out of the authority of his parents and he now becomes a head of a new family. And so I believe this text is primarily speaking to how is he governing his children that are under his care and under his authority, but certainly whatever age his kids are, they are a testimony to his quality of parenting or lack thereof, right? And so uh, another thing that I, I think is helpful for us to consider here is what is the trajectory in these things? What, what, is, what does one year ago look like? What does five years ago look like? What does 10 years ago look like? And what does today look like? And what does the future look like? Are we moving in a Godward direction or are we in a terrible place today? And so I think that that's helped me to sort of wrestle with with these qualifications here, exactly what Paul is driving at. But certainly he sees the household as a a proving ground for ministers. And their houses ought to be managed well. They ought to be leading their families spiritually. They ought to be shepherding their homes. They ought to have order. They ought not to be just chaos and out of control. And so he must manage his household well. Because what did Paul say? He said that if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? If his home's in disarray, then that's going to be a challenge for him to manage a flock of people. Secondly, he has to be a seasoned Christian. Not a new new convert. This one I think is, is, is fairly obvious as to why. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, We know, maybe you've been in a workplace where there was a need or in a church. 
There was a need. There was a void in the leadership. And so a new guy, young guys, put into leadership. It's way too soon. Maybe that was you at some point, out of your depth, right? And what does he say? The problem, one of the concerns, is that it goes to his head, right? He's puffed up, and, he, and all of a sudden, he's the boss. Yesterday, he was one of the guys. Today, he's running the show, and he starts to wield his authority sort of in an authoritarian fashion. Another problem here in the church is that a new believer lacks biblical wisdom that he needs, right? He lacks that time himself of living by faith, living by prayer, living according to the word. Um, and, and I've seen this myself, and I won't name names here. I'm not meaning to pick fun. But in one discipleship ministry, um, praise God, their model is to raise up men from within. And that's what we're talking about here, right? That's what we want to do. That's what the Bible says. But men in this ministry get raised up in 60 days, right? Some of them have only just professed faith in those 60 days, right? And so sometimes it's wonderful. They get raised up, and almost every time they get a big head, and then God humbles them, and Lord willing, they receive discipline, and they grow, and it's a beautiful thing. Many times it's clearly seen that these men had no business being in leadership because, not that they're bad men, it was just far too soon. Right? It was just far too soon. And so we want to be careful. I think there's a warning here for us and churches in general that oftentimes we're, we're hungry for men that are called and, and faithful. And so a young guy comes in the church, a young convert, and he's hungry for the Bible. He's hungry to read. He's hungry to grow. And we say, he's called to preach. This man's going to be a pastor. Look at him. He loves God and he's excited. So let's, let's raise him up. Let's, let's, let's use him. And it's too early. And he may very well not be called at all. He's just a hungry Christian who loves God and wants to read the scripture and study the word. And so we want to be slow with a new believer, a new convert, because it will be harmful to his soul and to the church and those around him. Lastly and thirdly here, he is to be thought well of by outsiders. Thought well of by outsiders. Verse 7 Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may fall into, not fall into disgrace and into the snare of the devil. Now, this is interesting, I, I think, in our context where there is an on-the-surface animosity for the church in the world. Like, it's not hidden. It's not under the surface. You know, if we would go back in our DeLorean 75 years or something Uh, it might be that a pastor would have been a respected person in the community. You might not agree with his faith, but he would have been seen as a man of integrity, he's a leader in the community, he's faithful in all of those things, and and it might have been a measure of uh, of respect. Oh, he's a local pastor at the local church. Not so today, right? At least not so outside of the church. And in a lot of ways, the opposite is true, that, that, that Christians are seen as bigots and all the rest of it. And so how do we square? How, how is a man to have a good reputation outside if he's faithful to Christ? Because I, I might even say, <laughs> if he's too loved by the world, if he's too respected by the world, he might be living a, a secret faith that never is, is evident. Um, but I like how one, one man said it. He said, they don't have to love his doctrine, but they should recognize his integrity. They don't have to love what he's about, but if they're honest, he's a respectable, trustworthy man. Right? He's not a concern. He's your neighbor. You're not concerned that he's going to steal your stuff or, or do something weird to you. He's, a, he's an upstanding man in society. Now, if he's seen in the community as a swindler, as an unkind, untrustworthy man that lacks integrity, maybe he has a business and everyone says, don't call that guy. You know, you don't, you, he ripped me off or he's, he's dishonest. That's probably not the man that is ready to be raised up as an elder in the church. And so uh, he needs to be thought well of, not that they love his theology, but that they recognize his integrity. And I made that joke about Facebook because some have come and said things about me that I'm this or that um, because we go to the abortion clinic and all of that. You can see those. They're, they're there for public um, consumption, right? Um, if we're going to be thought poorly of by outsiders, let it be for the right reasons, right? Not because we're jerks, not because we're abusive, but because we declare the mysteries of Christ with faithfulness. And the world certainly will not love that, not in our day. So we've spent three weeks 
trying to understand what biblical elders are. Um, and the idea here with First and Second Timothy preaching out of it, and with these three sermons, is to present a vision of a biblically ordered church. What does the Bible say? Again, what does the Bible say? That's our simple question with everything, right? What does the Bible say, and how do we then do that? How do we model that? And I believe the Bible teaches that a faithful church is elder-led, deacon-served, and congregationally affirmed. We can talk more about that. Elder-led, deacon-served, congregationally affirmed. And so I, I hope that you're catching a vision of how the Bible speaks of a healthy, ordered church with a plurality of men leading together. They are, they are united together to seek the mind of Christ for the church. And so my heart here is that regardless if we have 20 people or 200 or 2,000 people, uh, that we would be faithful to the scripture and pursue what God has said for his church. So let me close with a couple thoughts. Uh, I, I touched on this last week, sort of expanding why is this helpful? Why, why, why would we as a church be helped if we press forward or keep continuing towards plural eldership? Um, I believe that this, is a, this will benefit the long-term health of this body. We're not thinking two years, we're not thinking five years, but we're thinking 10, 20 years down the road. Because what happens when you have a group of men that are laying a culture in a church, that are shepherding together in a church, the loss of one man doesn't change the whole ministry, right? We all know that when a, when a pastor leaves a church, often the whole church almost turns over. We have here 20% of the folks, for a variety of reasons why, but still, um, the church turns over. And when there's no established leadership within the body, the new pastor is coming in starting from ground zero and kind of starting over, trying to lay his own foundation and how he understands things. But if there's a group of men already, maybe there's a man that's ready to be raised up that's already in the church, that, that'd be ideal. But even if not, that next pastor comes in to a group of men that have been laboring together for the good of this church, and there is a culture that is already in place that he just sort of comes into and is an addition and a help instead of that constant turning over every time a pastor leaves the church. And someone asks, I'll say it again, this is not me preparing my departure. <laughs> okay, I have no aspiration to leave right now. I'm, I'm blessed to be here and want to see this church grow in every way, not numerically only, that's good, but in health and all of these things. So that's, that's, that's the purpose. So I think this sets us up long term to be healthy, down, down the road. Uh, and secondly, sort of connected here, and I mentioned similar thing last week, is that this helps us get away from a clergy-focused model. Now, I don't know that this is a huge problem for us, um, but in the scripture, we see the church um, is explained, uh, illustrated as not a, not a corporation, right? not a Fortune 500 company, but a family. The church is a family. And so it is led not by a CEO that has all the smarts, who's sort of aloof of the goings-on of the people in the pew, but it's led by a group of faithful men that are amongst the family. They're just men of the body. They're not superior. They're not greater than everyone else. Uh, they are leaders from, from among the people. Hopefully they are homegrown men that have risen up in the ranks of the church. And so a plural elder model gets us out of that mindset that the paid professional is the only one that can teach or should teach or should minister. But we want to cultivate an environment where, where men are being trained and raised up, where there's a, a culture of discipleship and growth in that regard. And I think this gets us away from that, again, clergy-focused model. As I told the story of the man who was an interim pastor, and for 11 years he came to churches, and when the pastor would leave, there was no one to preach, no one to fill the pulpit, no one to step in there. That's, that's, that's a sad testament to those to those churches and we want to we want to get away from that right we want to we want to see a group of men that are leading faithfully this body so lastly again i want to encourage you to pray encourage you to pray that we would faithfully identify train observe test and raise up men for the health and growth of this body and i want you to pray that we would be faithful stewards that we would pray that we would till the soil that we would plant the seed that we would do all of the hard work, continue to grow and reform this church into a biblically healthy, ordered church, and then trust God 
to bring that rain and to bring that increase as he is pleased to do. Amen? Let's pray.